Good evening and welcome to the Apostolic Revival Center in Peru. I started off with a headset and realized the battery died on me. So I switched to a handheld pretty quick. But we're glad that you've uh, joined us tonight, our Friday night kingdom conversation. And um, we, on Friday nights, currently are speaking <clears throat> from a fairly empty sanctuary. Um, and we discuss a biblical topic um, that's relevant. Of course, every biblical topic is relevant, but this one particular for this moment. So anyways, we're glad that you have joined us. We will be meeting in person tomorrow as we do every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and we would love to have you uh, with us. Uh, I think last Saturday, the church has been here since 1958. So what is that? 63 years? We set our all-time regular weekend attendance record on a regular uh, Saturday. Now, that's not special events. That's just a regular weekend service. We had 241 here, and for small town, Peru, Indiana, we're thankful for that. We really are. The Lord's gracious to us, and um, <clears throat> we are glad that you've joined us tonight. People always ask how they can give. We want to put up our giving links on there just in case you... Um, want to do that no pressure whatsoever but people always ask so we just give it out ahead of time you can go to our website which is at the bottom of the screen on your screen right now which is revivalcenterperu.com www.revivalcenterperu.com and there's two giving links via paypal or cash app and you can find us there by typing in those uh, addresses above for paypal and for cash app dollar sign Chris Reed Ministries. So thank you to all of you who give and support and are a blessing to our ministry. And we pray that you will uh, join us uh, tomorrow in person. You are invited to be with us. We would love to have you. It's an exciting time. You probably noticed our stage right now is totally jacked up. And that's okay, though, because it's being jacked up for a reason. Uh, we're going to be having our drama um, depicting the life of Messiah here. I believe it's April 16th, 17th, and 18th. That's a Friday night at 7, Saturday at 11 a.m., and a Sunday at, is it 3, 3 p.m. But also, um, in two weekends from tomorrow, we are having our Passover weekend slash banquet. And so two weeks from tomorrow which is the uh, 27th, will be on that Saturday. Uh, so here's, here's how a lot of people are doing. A lot of people are coming in from different areas, different states, different cities. They're coming in, reserving a motel, going to be here for the service on Saturday morning at 11 a.m. for the beginning of Passover weekend. And, and then the next day, Sunday, the 28th, um, we are having a meet and greet from 2 to 5, okay, 4 to 6, I'm sorry. 4 to 6, I'll get it right eventually. Trying to remember too many things. Uh, 4 to 6 p.m. on Sunday the 28th, and then shortly after that, uh, we'll begin the banquet. I believe we've only sold 37 tickets. I just got two more uh, purchases in the mail. Now listen, to the local congregation, we need tomorrow for you to give us, uh, let us know that you're going to be there. And um, it is $30 a ticket, but it's worth it. It is going to be worth it. And we were just talking up here on the stage before we got started just about how so thankful, and we say this with all humility, but truly a thankful heart, God has protected the Ark of Peru and I believe it's because we celebrate the feast days, particularly the Passover at this time of the year. And you know what's interesting? Last year we celebrated the Passover. Um, and I think it was like in that five or six week period where we were doing parking lot services. We never stopped having church. Uh, but <clears throat> there were a few, just a handful of weeks, I remember four or five, where people were sitting out on the parking lot and hearing the gospel preached and and um, But then all summer, all fall, all winter, uh, we've been having church inside with literally 
visitors from everywhere. Every weekend, not just once hit and miss, I'm talking multiple states every weekend, plus our local people. And I only know of two or three, maybe four of our people that were even diagnosed with COVID. And I'm not saying that there's not more than that, but I only know of that. And, you know, many people can just sort of dismiss it and say, well, it's just a town of 12,000 or however you want to say it. But I, I don't think that's the case because there's other places wh who have bigger churches and smaller groups than ours who have had COVID outbreaks in their churches. And my heart of compassion, my goodness, uh, I cannot say enough how much uh, compassion I have for them. But I do believe there is a special blessing for keeping the Passover. And you know, one of the things associated with the Passover, the Lord promised the children of Israel. <clears throat> he said that because they kept the Passover, that the afflictions that were coming upon the Egyptians would not overtake the children of God. And I believe the word of God. I believe the word of God. And I don't take any credit for it. And I don't think we've been, you know, super careless. I mean, we've asked people to not shake hands and not get in each other's faces and to wash their hands. And we've had hand sanitizer everywhere. But um, I really, truly believe the Lord has sovereignly protected us. And I'm super thankful to God alone um, for him protecting us and keeping us safe preserving our people. And so in two weekends, uh, we are going to be celebrating uh, the Passover here and having our Passover uh, banquet. It is formal. I mean, I know people that are wearing suits and, you know, uh, buying dresses and, and we believe in doing it up big. You say, why do you believe in doing that? Because we recognize the occasion as a sacred thing to God. You say, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. Well, it means something to God. And so we're honoring it, celebrating it, commemorating it. And um, I know there'll be anywhere from two to 300 people here this, that weekend celebrating the Passover with us. And so we invite you now, um, if you come tomorrow and you want to buy tickets, um, you can see um, Rachel King or uh, Vicki. Baker, right up here, who's on the stage with me tonight. Of course, Rachel King is our secretary treasurer, and so if you want to buy tickets, see them. But we've got to get the number in from the local congregation. We've got to get you, um, we got to get a, an account because this is being catered, okay? And so uh, please hear me. I'm warning some of you late, last minute procrastinators are going to get disappointed when you come up a day or two ahead of time before the banquet and say, can I still come? And it's not that we don't want you to. It's that we have to give account ahead of time to know how much food for the caters to prepare. So anyways, that's in two weeks from this weekend. And then the drama's coming up. And we want to invite you to that as well. We hope you do. We're going to be advertising on the radio and different things here. And so... We're glad that you're with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. By the way, if you're watching now and you believe in what we teach and preach here and you value it, would you just, if you're watching, uh, streaming it on Facebook Live, please share it right wherever you are um, because I believe this is a needed message uh, tonight. And by the way, next weekend, um, I'm going to start teaching quite a bit of heavy in-depth on the Passover, what it means just a lot of in-depth teaching on it so be sure to uh, join us next week and thank you for sharing it uh, on your facebook page as a witness to people who are on your facebook page i want to um, teach tonight and we're going to have a conversation a kingdom conversation i believe on an all-important subject that is i believe it's god's most powerful weapon and Tonight, the title of this kingdom conversation, if I was to entitle it, is the agape prayer. And I'm going to show you uh, something from the word of God, a prayer. Everybody knows the Lord's prayer, um, but this is a prayer that is easily overlooked. And it's in the New Testament, 
Of course, agape is the highest form of love. It's the God kind of love, divine love. Phileo is another kind of love. It's the Greek word phileo is like for once we get Philadelphia, brotherly love. But this kind of love that I want to talk tonight about is the agape love. And it's in the form of a prayer. And this is a prayer that you can pr- begin to pray in your daily prayer life. And as I said, this is so easy to overlook. I think most people are not even aware it's in the Word of God. Um, but if you'll turn with me in Philippians chapter 1, and this is a, Paul, a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed. Philippians chapter 1 and uh, verse 9. And Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and the, he sneaks in this all-important prayer that I believe is I believe if you'll begin to pray this daily, it will transform your life. And you can truly begin to live loved, as Sister Vicki often says. So here, this is this prayer, as I said, often overlooked, but the most, I believe one of the most powerful prayers in the Word of God. And Paul says this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. And this I pray, that your love, the word there for love is agape, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ and the glory and praise of God." What an incredible prayer. And I imagine most of you that are watching this perhaps have, didn't even perhaps even think of that. Maybe you've read it, read over it many times, but didn't realize the gravity of what you were reading. This was a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed as he became perfected. Now, just for a few minutes here, and then we're going to actually begin to dissect Uh, the prayer and show you exactly what Paul was meaning. But when we talk about love, um, the liberals, when I say liberals, when they hear the word love, they, they, here's what they interpret. Anything and everything goes. No boundaries, no moral excellence, no clarity of right and wrong. But when ultra-conservatives hear the word love, they hear the word compromise. They think if you preach the love of God that, oh, that's just going to give occasion to people to just live however they want. And, and they try to measure up the love of God and compare it to their current level of love maturity or maturity of love or understanding of love. So they're not impressed with it. They just say, turn the page and preach me something else. But um, this agape prayer, and I think some of you that are listening, I would take notes on this. If you've got a pen and a paper, I'm going to begin to share with you some pretty profound things um, that I believe will transform your life. And here, here's where I'll start. We all too often demand perfection from those around us while conveniently overlooking our own shortcomings. Think about that. Most every Bible character who was used greatly by God overcame significant imperfections. They would be set down in most denominations. They would be disqualified in ministry by most denominations. Think about this for just a minute. Noah got drunk. Moses exhibited fear and disobedience by striking the rock. David the king was a murderer and an adulterer. And even the apostle Paul in his previous life was a blasphemer and a persecutor. I mean, the Bible is arrayed with some interesting characters. 
And I just want you to know that in a world that has a perverted form of love in liberalism and in a church that's afraid to talk about it because they're afraid of being labeled compromise, I, I want you to know tonight something very important that every person that listens now or later, you need to hear this important message. Nothing that you've done and nothing that you are is worse than what was display, displayed by people in the Bible. I want you to think about that. Yet God loved them and God used them in spite of their failures. So I think it would be safe to say tonight, instead of running from your weaknesses, we need to use them as opportunities to change, as instructions for growing in love. Abounding in love was what Paul prayed, that your love would abound yet more and more. In other words, he was insinuating that it is possible for your love to be limited, for you to put boundaries on your love. And I, I found that your fears, your frustrations, your prejudices, your pain can all be boundaries to growing in love for people. Perhaps you've been hurt, mistreated, taken advantage of. And oftentimes we take our own past experiences, our own fears, and we set this guard in place to make sure that that doesn't happen to us again. But in reality, what it does, it doesn't keep people out from hurting you. It keeps you imprisoned inside. And so I've learned this as Paul said that you're agape, that you would be perfected in the God kind of love and that you would abound, that it would abound more and more. And it's through understanding that is gained from this simple overlooked prayer that you will begin to become inoculated from all of these self-limitations. I think everybody that you would talk to would agree that living loved is important, that love is the highest achievement. It is the chief, the chief quality of a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. By this shall all men know you're my disciple. You know, this kind of love cannot be imitated. It can't be manufactured. It's a love without conditions. And that is a unique kind of love. It's a love that allows you to love your neighbor in the same degree that you love yourself. And this is the kind of love that does not allow itself to be limited with boundaries. In other words, we put no boundary or limitation on our willingness to love people, to accept people. That doesn't mean that we approve of any behavior. But aren't you glad that God loved and accepted you while you were yet a sinner? He died for you. As I said, this doesn't mean we accept everything they do or turn a deaf ear or blind eye to evil. But it does mean, however, that we do not allow their occupation, their social status, their ancestry, or their disagreeable attitude to be conditions for us to withhold love from them. You know, the deacon Stephen really <clears throat> embodied this kind of love that I'm talking about. In chapter 8 of the book of Acts, he had been branded as a heretic and was being stoned to death. Imagine being put to death that way. Totally inhumane. But those who had nothing but evil to say concerning them, concerning him rather, he loved them. They reviled him. They cursed him. They falsely accused him. They stoned him. They murdered him. Yet in all of his physical pain and torment, his last words were to forgive those. Whole, lay not this sin to their charge. 
was his final prayer. You know, most, most Christians, I hate to say, would be praying for God to avenge them. Lord, I can't help myself. I can't avenge those who have done me wrong. But you prove that I was right. You stand up for me, Lord. You see it in people's Facebook posts all the time. The attitude that is conveyed about wanting God to avenge them and justify them in some argument or personal quarrel that they have with someone else. It's sad that none of us, the fact is, none of us have, have been stoned to death like Stephen. But if someone even says a little hurtful thing to many of us, we become upset for days. And we get hurt and we avoid people, and we may even build up emotional fences to keep that person at a distance. But I wonder what would happen if Paul's prayer would be answered in our lives, the agape prayer, that we would grow and abound in love yet more and more so that we could demonstrate the love that allowed Stephen to show and demonstrate under worse circumstances than any of us have ever went through. Did you catch what I just said there? He was able to demonstrate a love that most of us can't under far worse circumstances that many of us will never be subject to. Yet God has given us the same ability. Most of us tolerate our enemies but very few have learned to love them. This agape prayer is a prayer of spiritual and emotional maturity. That's almost a curse word in some church circles. Emotional and spiritual maturity. This agape prayer is, I believe, one of the most important keys to mature us to the point to where we can even love our enemies. Most Christians have a hard time really, truly, adequately loving their friends and fellow believers, let alone their enemies. So you don't think this message is important for me to speak about? Oh, yes it is. Because as I said, most believers cannot even adequately love their family. I'm convinced that most of the people in our world that we know, not all, but many, I'll say many, not, I won't even use the word most, but many people don't even know how to love someone. And they don't even know how to love themselves. And, and the reason why so many people don't love others is because they don't love themselves. I mean, the commandments to love your neighbor is yourself. So some of us, by how we're treating others, actually reveal how we feel about ourselves. How sobering. And I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how long you've sat in a pew. I don't care what you wear or how long you've worn or what you don't wear or where you do, don't do. No, no, no. Jesus didn't say, now there's many truths that I'm going to sound like I'm minimizing but I'm not, okay? So do not misunderstand what I'm about to say. Jesus didn't say, by this shall all men know that you're my disciple. He didn't say, how loud you speak in tongues will men know you're my disciple. How often you speak in tongues. Now, I'm not minimizing speaking in tongues. Anybody that knows me knows I'm not. He didn't say, by how long your skirt is will men know that you're my disciple, even though that is the banner for, most, for a lot of Christians. That's their sign of their faith. He didn't say, by which church you go to will all men know you're my disciples. He didn't say, even by what name you were baptized in will they know. He didn't even say, by what day you worship on. And even all these things are important. And I know some of you are, oh my gosh, you're putting down my candy stick doctrine. No, I'm not. Because I think many of the, the things that I just said are very important. However, 
a lot of those people who believe a lot of things that are true are some of the most unloving people you'll ever meet. Because here's the thing that I want to, the point that I want to make. Especially in Pentecostal circles, we've been taught to love doctrine even at the expense of loving people. And I think that we have forgot that before you can win somebody to your belief, you got to win them to you. You got to make them feel loved. Let me tell you, people can feel if you love them. They can. They can feel it. You know, you can say all, all you want to, well, you know, that person gives me weird vibes, or, and I'm, I don't like to use the word vibes, but you get what I'm saying. That is common, uh, modern day vernacular. People can feel vibes <laughs> if you like them or you don't. Now, forget love for a minute. We're just talking about like. And I tell you, church, we have a long ways to go. And I want to say one more time, I am not minimizing any truth of the word of God. I'm saying that there's one thing that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, though you speak with tongues of men and angels and have not love, you're just making noise. Though you give your body to be burned, though you understand all Bible knowledge and doctrine and mysteries and have not love, it profits you nothing. Now think about that for just a minute. You can know the truth on every biblical subject and it still not profit you anything. Wow. That's what Paul said. Look it up, 1 Corinthians 13. He said, though I understand all mysteries, all doctrine, all truth of the word of God, and have not love, it profits me nothing. He didn't say it still profits me little. He said it profits me nothing. And I think that is a profound statement. You know, I'm convinced that the reason why we have an Apostle Paul writing to us tonight this prayer of love is because the last or the first Christian that impacted him was Stephen. So the man who wrote two-thirds of your New Testament, the man who wrote to us this agape prayer, was the man who held the coats of those who was stoning Stephen, who prayed for God to not hold to the charge of those who were brutally and unjustly murdering him. Don't you think that probably made an initial impact on Paul? He's the one that held the coats of them that were stoning this man that I'm talking about. And he gives to us this agape prayer. I'm convinced that this had an impact on Paul. You know why? Because in Acts chapter 8 was when Stephen was stoned. Chapter 9 was when Paul was converted. Think about that for just a minute. That's quite a statement. Undoubtedly, Stephen's love for his accusers, including Paul, demonstrated a godly, Paul, a go godly love that Paul in all of his religious upbringing, all of his Torah knowledge had not experienced. Abounding love. Remember what the prayer was? Keep up verse 9, if you would, back there, Crystal, please. And she does such a good job back there every week, and her and the whole family back there on the, uh, media, in the media booth. But, but look at verse 9, nine Philippians 1 and 9. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. Did you, did you catch this now? That, that is so profound. That your love may abound yet more and more. Abounding love. Say that with me. Abounding love. We've got to understand what it is and what it is not. Okay? Abounding love is not an acceptance of evil or a compromise of truth, 
It's not an acceptance of wrong actions on the parts of others, but rather it is an open heartedness toward everyone and a refusal to reject or hate someone else based on any differences. You may not agree with their lifestyle, their actions, but you realize that every person, no matter how seriously depraved they may be, they still possess human dignity because their life originated in God. They may not know it yet, but you do. Okay? And so we recognize every human being has human dignity and infinitesimal value and worth. But you know why our love has boundaries and it doesn't abound yet more and more? is because we judge people's worth oftentimes by how they make us feel. I want you to let that soak in. We often judge and determine how worthy someone is of our love, our affection, our kindness, based on how they make us feel. And people that we fear or those who are disagreeable, we love less. Let me say that again. People that we fear or those who are disagreeable with us, we love this, love less than those who bring acceptance and encouragement and validation to us. When we have conditional love, we're always trying to decide whom we're willing to love or who deserves it. And whom we are willing to overlook as not being worthy of our attention. We pick and choose. Give us just a minute here. We're we pick and choose among people who meet our conditions as being acceptable to love. My response in loving is conditioned upon my attitudes, my preconceptions, and my prejudices. This is why the use of labeling of individuals and groups to build boundaries is actually contrary to agape. You know, we label people so that we can justify keeping our fence up to them. We want to label people. People are unique. I have found this to be the case. People are individuals. That means they have individuality. And even though they may share some common traits with others as to their ethnicity, their education, their financial status, their religion, their physical size, and the like, Attempts to identify individuals solely according to the labels that we place. Predetermined conditions on them to determine our willingness to love them. Do you know we subconsciously categorize people? We do. We do not look at people oftentimes without judgment we pretty much have all of these measuring sticks in our mind based oftentimes what people do for a living, what kind of car they drive, sometimes even their ethnicity, where they go to church. And based on those things, we think we have them figured out. And we put up boundaries and it hinders our love from abounding more and more. So... We are continually judging ourselves, though, by attitudes and actions that we have towards others. Do you realize that is an important thing to get? This is what Jesus meant when he said, judge not, lest you be judged. For with the same measure that you judge is how you will be judged. You ever felt like 
that someone didn't give you a chance or they already wrote you off before you even had a chance to prove all the good qualities about you. If you'll think long and hard about that, you can probably go back in your mind and the Lord will bring to your attention someone you did that very same thing to. And many people say, no, I don't think I did. Well, you might be in denial because we've all done it. The key to love or God's love growing in us is to not, we, we're not justifying sin. We're not thinking that sin is okay. We're not agree, in agreement with immoral lifestyle choices. But do you understand that every human being that I meet, no matter how immoral or depraved, that they currently or I think they currently are, do you know that you can actually look and find, no matter how distorted it might be, you can find a, 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 a slim, a glimmer of the image of God in every person you meet? I don't care if it's the vilest person. You see, the key to love with God's love is to recognize that in everything and in everyone, there is a portion of God in them. Without it, without doing that, we are totally incapable of loving unconditionally. And we are totally incapable of allowing our love to abound more and more. So abounding love is able to look beyond circumstances, to love beyond what would normally turn into disappointment. It allows you to love beyond your anger and submit your rights to the test of love. What does that mean, submit your rights to the test of love? When you justify a boundary to put people out or not allow them in by saying things, I have a right to feel that way. I feel infringed upon, and that is what cancels your love, then your love is not abounding, it's regressing. We always talk about how God so loved the world, but I'm not sure we always, I mean, we, we, we glorify that concept, but is it reproduced through our actions and our relationships with everyone we meet? We love talking about the love of God as a doctrinal, biblical concept. But we categorize and label based upon appearances and what we've heard of other people. And we do it so often subconsciously that actually we have to actually start learning to think about what we're thinking about. Because if you don't, your thoughts will just be uncontrollable. And that's why the scripture says to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So when we talk about this, and there's so much more I could say, but I want to hurry uh, on and, and get through the main points of this prayer. Paul says in verse 9, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge. In knowledge and in all judgment. Now, when we talk about abounding love, he says that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked. You see, the knowledge spoken of by the Apostle Paul's prayer is a knowledge of God that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge. In other words, he's saying the only way that your love can abound and not have boundaries put up towards other people and label and categorize and cut people out of your life, the only way you can do that is have an increased knowledge of God. Now, this knowledge is the opposite of the knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve partook of to get us all in this mess. The knowledge of good and evil had to be present to humankind to give them the ability to choose between a carnal nature 
or spiritual nature. You ever looked at the Bible and you thought, man, we could have avoided this whole mess if God just wouldn't have put that one forbidden tree in the garden. I mean, I've had people ask me that question. Wouldn't it have just been better if God would have not put the one tree in the garden that he said that you're not to eat from? Wouldn't it have saved us all from a bunch of pain and sorrow and suffering and sickness? Yeah, it would have. But God did not create man to be a pre-programmed robot. What is love if there's not a choice involved? What, what would it even mean to love God if there wasn't something else you could choose instead? And man chose something else instead. And the consequences came about. And many still are blaming and bitter at God for those consequences. Evil and crime and sin and murder and, you know, rape and child trafficking, all these terrible things in the world. Uh, but God said the day you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. It's not that God is okaying every murder or every child that's molested. He's not okaying that or every child that's going hungry in Africa. He's not okaying that. It's kind of like this. The law of gravity says what goes up must come down. Now, the way you test that is you walk out to the edge of a cliff and you see about a 60-foot drop-off. Now, you can be told the law of gravity. You can be told over and over, this is what's going to happen if you drop off, if you step off. So don't do it, whatever you do. There's always somebody that's going to do it. It's just within human nature to do what's forbidden, right? We're driven by not the concept of, I'm not going to let anybody tell me what I can and can't do, especially Americans. You know, that's kind of in our nature. And so no matter... What consequences are involved in that? If you're told you step out over that cliff, you're going to fall. Can you walk out, step over the cliff, drop 60 feet, break your neck, and blame God? And be bitter at God? Of course you can't. But people do it every day. I mean, the label warnings on alcohol is, can cause liver damage. They drank till there's holes through their liver and then blame God for their suffering. I mean, think about it. They, they're laying on a hospital bed dying, and I'm not making fun, or certainly I'm not making light. I have family that have been through this very thing. Holes in their liver or, you know, whatever the case may be, and they're laying there bitter thinking, well, if God was real, he wouldn't have allowed this to happen to me. What you're saying is, is you wish God would have made you a robot instead of giving you choice. You would have never have married your spouse if you thought they were forced to. It's because they chose you when they could have chose ever anyone else. But they didn't. They chose you. And that's what makes it love. Well, that's why God put the tree in the garden. Because he wanted a relationship with man that chose him. Not was forced to live for him. So, as you pray this prayer, first, I'm sorry, Philippians 1 and 9, that your love may, and I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge. When you pray that prayer... God will begin to use the knowledge you already possess about a number of things to bring forth spiritual knowledge. As you seek to know him, he converts your natural knowledge into spiritual knowledge. And everything we see in the positives and the negatives, everything is in opposition to something else. You realize that? Everything is. The Democrats are against the Republicans. The Republicans are against the Democrats. Why? So that you make a choice. The Bible tells us God created the light and the darkness. He created the good and the evil. Choice is involved because of that. 
A culture that pursues knowledge about the natural world separate from a knowledge of God, they will advance technologically but will always regress spiritually. This is what's happened to America. We've pursued more and more and more knowledge of the natural technologic technology and so on and so forth. But when that pursue that pursuit of knowledge, of natural knowledge, is not also pursuing spiritual knowledge, then you progress in natural knowledge and regress in spiritual knowledge. And so what happens is you end up with a culture that has problems that there is no earthly solution to. Do you know I believe our nation right now is in such a place. You can say this is, sounds hopeless, but it's just a fact. I believe our nation is in such a place right now. The division is so deep. The problems are so bad that it's beyond human remedy. It is. It's beyond human remedy because we've lived in a culture that has glorified the advancement of natural knowledge while neglecting spiritual. You know, beginning by taking God out of our culture little by little by little over the last 50 years. And, you know, as I think about that, I also think about how that we are living literally in a time where they, this bill, this HR1 bill that Congress is looking to pass right now, and one of the congressmen from New York, Jerry Nadler, made a statement when the, the, the discussion was brought up about, well, this will compromise the boundaries of, you know, allowing men to go in women's restrooms and so on and so forth. And, and that, com that conversation come up, and his, this was quoted on the news. His exact words were, we don't care what God thinks about this. So the knowledge that most people seek is anchored in a quest to attain what is commonly called happiness. And they think happiness is determined by controlling their personal world by acquiring more and more material possessions. But that doesn't bring true happiness. All too often we've acquired a knowledge about God, but not a knowledge of God. There is a big difference. For love to grow, we need a greater knowledge of God. When you begin to pray, say things like that my love would abound in knowledge, you're activating a spiritual force that will lead you to your divine image and destiny. When you begin to access divine knowledge about who you are, who you're created to be, what is unique about you in the eyes of God, when you discover this, you begin to understand why you act the way you do, why you're programmed the way you are, why you are acquire an ability to bring forth personal transformation. And this knowledge of God or this awareness will help you understand you're not a cosmic accident, but you're a divine happening when you ask that our love may grow in knowledge what you're saying is is lord help me to figure out why i think the way i do give me that knowledge why I, what makes me tick what makes me to respond to people the way i respond to people the next thing he says that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that word judgment there could also be translated discernment discernment or judgment is simply the ability to make a proper decision between two things when we make judgments we make a decision to do something or to not do it to accept something or to reject something to do good or to do evil 
to help or withhold help, to love or hold back love, to seek our divine connection with God or just to remain as we are. Judgment allows us as we grow in love and as we grow in that love and it's connected to a knowledge of God and who we are in God, it also love affects our judgment. Love abounding agape does not just affect our knowledge, it affects how we judge. Now th- judgment allows me to determine the desired direction of my life in relation to the lives of people around me. This is because proper judgment allows us to grow in love and in knowledge. What does it look like to grow in love? What does it look like to grow in knowledge? Well, here's what growing in love with knowledge looks like. My perspective of God is the knowledge. My perspective of myself and who I am and why I'm here on the earth is in knowledge. And when love grows and abounds through that knowledge and then through judgment, judgment in this sense is really discernment which is the spiritual sense or the ability to know this is of God, this is not of God, right? Since God is love, then all decisions that come from this connection will be right. Perhaps you've listened to a minister before, and when you heard him preach, something within you says, that is right. Perhaps you've heard somebody say something like, my spirit bears witness with what he's saying. Or perhaps you've listened to another minister get up and preach before, and you've heard him say something, and something within you says, I just don't think that's quite right. Now, judgment that has abounded in love is the ability to discern, to, to, to discern excuse me, and to determine with what he's saying if it aligns with the God of the Bible. Immature judgment says, I don't like, I don't agree with what he's saying, not because the Bible might or might not say it's wrong, but because it goes against my agenda or it contradicts my lifestyle or it challenges the direction my life is going. And so immature judgment, spiritual immature judgment, says that's not right even though it is because then it doesn't align with my current place spiritually. Mature judgment perfected by love says what he's saying may hurt and challenge me, but I know it's right. Do you see the difference? One judgment that is immature is based off of personal biases being attacked. The other person recognizes, oh my goodness, I can improve in this area of my life. Instead of being offended, I'm going to be motivated. That's what abounding love in judgment does. See, abounding love in knowledge says, this is what God says about me. This is what God says about you. This is what God says about why I'm here on the earth. So now let's do everything we can in abounding love to cooperate in that biblical knowledge. Abounding love in judgment says, this is of God, not because of my personal bias, or how about this one? You hear, you meet someone new in the church, and something within you says, I don't know what it is about them, but they just, I don't like them. They kind of rub me the wrong way. Is it because of something they believe? Is it because of a personality defect in them? Or is it your own insecurities are being challenged? Maybe their gifting, their talent, their anointing might lead to you thinking there's competition. That's a falsehood, but 
I'm just saying that that judgment that is a result. You know, you hear the verse quote, judge not lest you be judged. That's true. Judge not. And I think that's some, some people, that's the only Bible verse they know. And the, the only verse they know, they have a false understanding of it. It's not saying you can't judge it because in, in other scriptures, Jesus said to judge, but do it righteously. The only way that you can judge and be trusted with judgment is if you've abounded in love. Because then your judgment is based on maturity and not based on immature personal biases. Well, I don't like that person because how they look or they remind me of someone that hurt me from a long time ago or fill in the blank. I mean, you, you don't think this is, this is literally life every day. So our love has to affect our knowledge. Our love has to affect our judgment. And then he doesn't say that, doesn't stop there. Verse 10, he says that you may approve things that are excellent. What is excellence? Whether you are developing a manned flight to Mars or you're preparing to win an athletic contest or you're cleaning the house or trying to solve world hunger or developing a better pencil or cooking your next meal or seeking to grow into maturity to grow in your gifts, to grow in your calling, to attain your destiny, to communicate better. A desire to do all of the above in the spirit of excellence is what determines and characterizes the outcome. Something changed in our world. I don't know when it what happened. I, I don't, I, I'm not blaming any one person or any people group for it happening. But there was a time in our nation where people prided themselves in hard work, in producing a good product, acquiring excellence, striving for excellence. Now we've just become, by and large, slothful and sloppy. Even in how people approach their job, their marriage, how they discipline their children, we're just kind of half approached towards it. Even how people approach living for the Lord. They're halfway in, halfway out, hit and miss. Pray, have a prayer life for about a week or two, then they get bored with it, and then it goes prayer time, devolves back into their TV watching. Nothing wrong with TV, I'm just saying it's got to have its place. We have got, and you know the only way that, that excellence will become a priority to us again is when we abound in love. Because abounding love affects how I think about myself, the people that are in my world, and how my behavior and actions affect them the institution, the, the, uh, the government, the culture, the organization that we're all a part of, trying to make it a better place. That's excellence. That you may approve things that are excellent. I want to tell you something. Abounding love will cause you to start pursuing things that are excellent. Not just good, excellent. And I think that we need to start pursuing excellence again as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he ends it by saying, and I've just scratched the surface to be honest with you, but he says that you may be sincere. You know what? When your love abounds, there'll never be a time where you're not sincere. Insincerity will not be able to be said about you. And here's the next one is a big one. When you are abounding in love, that you may be sincere and without offense. Do you know why we live in a world where everybody's offended over everything? Because we live in a world that hasn't been perfected by love. A 
offense. People are offended now. Seriously, I'm not just making this up. If you've watched the news, you know, people are offended by Dr. Seuss now. Well, that offends me. <laughs> What's the other thing that come up here recently that, yeah, Mr. Potato Head. I mean, if you would have told me 10 years ago that this would be an argument in our culture, I would think you were nuts. I mean, people have become hyperly sensitive. E yeah, even the Muppets. Everything has a secret message or meaning that's to attack some person or some people group. And, and it's because, I'll, I'll say it this way, the more you have abounded in true love and you have matured in love, the less that you can be offended. I'll say this way, church people sometimes can be the most offended or offensive people you ever meet. You ever, you ever met church folks that get offended? Hang around for a while. I mean, the, the style of music, the volume of the music, the temperature in the church. I mean, you would not believe but you know, when you have abounded in love, if someone looks at you the wrong way or doesn't shake your hand, you're so secure in who you are that one person's actions or words doesn't ruin your day. Because not only can you approve things that are excellent, and strive for excellence in your day-to-day -day life and your home life and your job and that you can be sincere and without offense. I choose to be offended. Now you might say, you know the real reason why, what the root of offense is? If you've ever been offended at someone or something, it's because you genuinely believed that whoever did the offending did not, whatever they said or did, you believe that they didn't do it with your true worth and value in mind. That's why you were offended. But what happens when you abound in love? When you abound in love, you can love someone even in their place of immaturity and even when their immaturity means they don't value you to the degree they should, it doesn't affect you, you're not insecure, and you don't put up fences. Your love isn't regressing, it's abounding. In other words, I'm not, because they've offended me, they said hurtful things, I'm not going to put up a fence, I'm not going to put up a boundary, I'm not going to stop being nice to them. They may snub me, turn their nose at me, but I'm going to be nice to them anyways because I'm abounding in love and that's my prayer. I think we ought to start praying this prayer. And this I pray, and make it personal in the first person. And this I pray, verse 9, that my love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that I may approve things that are excellent, that I may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. The agape prayer. And as you abound in love, it helps you to have proper and mature judgment, proper and mature knowledge, pursuing excellence in your life, and living a life free of offense. Isn't that the life that is easy to maintain your joy? People that can't maintain joy have not abounded yet. The agape prayer has not been answered in their life. Wow. And I could just go on and on, but I'll go ahead and start, and I'll have uh, Brother Rick uh, go ahead and comment first. You know, one of the things I was thinking about when it comes to that verse that says, uh, where am I? 
he says uh, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense. Uh, that really jumped out at me that I see so many people, uh, they are very sincere, but they can be con completely wrong. You know, in the scriptures, uh, the tax collectors were very sincere in what they were doing, but they were, they were wrong and they needed repentance. But then you have the, the uh, religious leaders who were without offense. They followed the letter of the law, but they lacked a real genuine love for people. They lost sight of that. And so as we sometimes do, we, we come to a level of love that we think, We've arrived, and we stop. But this scripture, this passage, is it's a growing thing, abound more and more. It's a thing that we never should come to a point where we're satisfied with our level of, of loving God and loving people. You can't love people, love God, and treat people. You can't do that. People say, oh, I love Jesus, and they're the meanest they hurt people. They say bad things about people. <coughs> Excuse me. And I say, how can you love God when you treat people that way? So there's a, we have to come to a point where we just say, God, I, I want to grow in my love for you. We can pat ourselves on the back a lot of times. Look what I've accomplished. I'm doing good. You see, every time I've ever got to that point in my life, the Lord will bring somebody into my life that will challenge that. <laughs> you know, he'll challenge me with that. It's like, I thought I had this. God said, no. Because you see, God knows our hearts. We can be surface people. We're surface people. We don't like to get deep. God's a God that knows our hearts. And we like to put on the mask. We like to put a little cover up and say, I'm doing good. God said, no, you're not doing near as good as you think you are. So we have to realize that this is a growing process that God wants us to take us deeper. Never get to the point where we're satisfied with where we're at. You're right. It's got to be hunger. There's a hunger there that is lacking in a lot of people's lives. We come to a spiritual level and say, I'm content to live right here. And they miss so much more of what God wants to do, to abound more and more. Oh, wow. That's an amazing thing. If we just say, God, I want to grow deeper in you. I want more of you. You know, I think sometimes I get to a point where I think I, I'm really walking deep with the Lord. And I realize he shows me something and I'm going, I'm not even scratching the surface. He's got so much more for me. So don't ever come to a point where you're satisfied at your level of love, your level of spirituality. Never get to a point where you're satisfied. Satisfaction is the greatest hindrance to growth that I know. And, we, and religion teaches that. Religion says, you're good enough. You're doing all right. No, people aren't our judge. God is our judge. And so he's challenging us to go deeper. It's all, it's all about him. His love is so much deeper. Like Chris was saying, we get easily offended. What if Jesus operated the way you and I love? Think about it. What would, what would, where would we be if we loved, if Jesus loved as we love? I don't even like the thoughts of that. Man. Love him with all your heart. 
You know, David prayed and he said, search my heart, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me, anything that offends, anything that is holding me back from knowing you more. That's what, that's what gotta be our prayer. When we pray this prayer, this agape prayer, it's gonna transform our lives and it'll cause us to think differently. Like Chris said, it's time for us to think differently. We gotta stop thinking with this and start thinking with our heart, saying, God, show me, teach me more of you, less of me. That'd make a good song. More of you and less of me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the scripture says, if you can't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you've not? The Ten Commandments, which are so important, the first four are about loving God. The last six are about loving your neighbor. Have no other gods before me. Um, no graven images. Don't take his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. That's love the Lord your God with all your heart. But thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not bear false witness. That's how we love others or don't love them. And I think that that's, that's the point of this prayer is we, we talk about how God's love has no measure. Well, unfortunately, ours does. And that's why the agape prayer says that your love may abound yet more and more. I looked up while Rick was talking about um, sharing there and the word abound by definition means increasing in large numbers and I think what Paul was saying there is this prayer causes our love to be stretched to not put limitations on people to not categorize people to not because you see when you're immature in love then you won't pursue a knowledge of God and what he says about you and your purpose and see God's purpose and others you'll want to know the recent knowledge or gossip about someone else you know whether it's online or in person so abounding love causes you to say I don't want to know what they've done wrong I want to know about I want to pursue God and all the ways of God because he's perfect and his love has no boundaries mine does and I want mine to abound and when your love is abound, not only will your knowledge be right, but your judgment can be trusted. Seriously. The last thing you'll ever want to do is go to a person who is immature in love and ask them to pass judgment on a situation. Because they'll always side with the people that make them feel good. They'll always side with the judgment that betters them, promotes them, helps them, preserves their reputation or name, they've not been perfected by love. If your uh, love is abounding, you'll pursue excellence. You won't want to do anything half-hearted, but you want to do it with all your heart. Love, 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 love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. That's what excellence is about. And your neighbor too. That's what excellence does. It doesn't allow for sloppiness or half-heartedness or half-trying or half-committed or half-on-fire or half-time, part-time. Excellence. And then that excellence says, I don't have to be offended. You say, all these things seem out of reach to me. If you grow and your love abounds, they will come naturally to you. Abounding love, that's what it looks like. You have healthy judgment. You're pursuing a greater knowledge of God. You're without offense and a life striving for excellence. You say, well, I don't think I can produce that myself. No. Ask God. Pray this prayer. Start praying this prayer that his agape would abound in you and those things will naturally happen because of your abounding love. We were speaking of abounding love. And if you remember in Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus said, because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's a good picture of what's going on in our world today is 
Iniquity or lawlessness is abounding, and it's causing love to wax cold. So we have a choice in the matter. What is in First John? John said that if you fear, you are not made perfect in love. So there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. And a lot of people hold back because of some kind of fear. They don't allow their love to come out. And they become possessive. You cannot possess love. You have to become made into the image of love. Love is not something you can possess. Remember that. And I'm going to share some personal things uh, with the uh, congregation and with this panel. But um, there came a point in my life, I asked the Lord, make me into your image. And uh, these are just some personal things that he, he gave me. And he took me, and I'm still going through it because we're all being perfected in love. He took me to what I call the school of love. And he taught me some very, very uh, uh, profound things. And one thing he taught me was his ways are above mine and his thoughts are above mine. So we have this definition and this base level knowledge of love. And we say, well, this is love. This makes me feel good. But his is way up here. And you have to ascend to that. And that takes humility. But he says, and one of the things he said to me, he said, love is the most potent, fragrant energy in the spirit. Love attracts angels. It is the essence of creation. Love is God. God is love. Faith and hope attract angels as well. And faith will cause you to forgive, but love will cause you to release. Remember that. Faith will bring you to the place where you can say, Okay, God, I trust you. I'll forgive. But love will say, Okay, I release it. And then... He said, you can't approach God without a covering of love. Love covers. Charity. Peter said to have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. That was Peter, wasn't it? I believe so. And then there came a point where he said, on another day, he asked me the question, he said, can you love without being shown love back? True love comes out of character. It's the character of God. It's the character of the I am within you. And God said, I love even when I am not always loved back. This is true love. I am love. He said, true love comes from the source of love, which is a deep well. And, is not, and the flow... And the, and the pouring out of this well is not relegated to another's reaction to being loved. And one more thing. He said, a person can give without loving, but cannot truly love without giving. They can serve without love, but can't love without serving. Love is action, and God is love. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, well, that comes from a covering. And you have to humble yourself and say, God, my ways are not good enough. My definition is not good enough. God will take you to the school of love, and he'll show you your selfishness, but he'll, you'll see your selfishness because we all have a, a level of selfishness and a measure of it. Some is greater, some is less. He'll show you through his love. And you'll realize how far away you are really from meeting the definition of that love. And you'll say, I just need to become more love. I can't possess it. It's not something that I did to earn it on my own. Uh, I could just become love. And as I behold him, I become like him. Remember when Adam and Eve chose to sin? He didn't, they, they became corrupted and God covered them. 
Instead of destroying them, he covered them. Instead of saying, I'm finished with you, I'm done with you, I'm going to start all over. No, he said, you know what? I'll bring more glory to myself in loving fallen creatures that I made and bringing them back to perfection. That's the definition of love. It comes out of God's character. It is not anything that you can put a definition from this earthly realm. It is solely from the character and the image and the, nat the nature of God and his heart. So let's love one another. You can't manufacture it. It's completely from God. It's not fake. It's potent and it's real. And, and we're on our way to becoming love, perfected. You know, when, they brought, when the scriptures would come up, I, I looked at that and I thought, what's the purpose? Why was this prayer prayed? What's the outcome of this going to be? Hallelujah. I, I liked everything that was said here tonight, and it's so powerful. Um, because once you do that, you deny yourself, and you know that love casts out all fear. That means any possibility of anything that comes upon you, God's already taken care of it. It doesn't matter if you were on the receiving or the giving end of being bad. If it was some bad circumstance, if it was something that blowed your heart and mind, God had it covered. And then this prayer was brought up in this word. And my question was why? Why was that done? And what's the outcome for Hallelujah. And, and I've, I've, I've also matured so much in these last probably three or four years. And I've, I don't know how many times I've been on my face and I've asked God specifically, help me to love people the way you love people. Help me put my love down and pick up yours. And when I seen this prayer, and I, I've read it many times, I, I seen something that I thought strengthened me tonight, and it was this. If I can go out and abound in the knowledge and the wisdom, what that meant to me was this. No matter what the circumstance is, hallelujah, with all my heart, with all my strength that I get from God, it doesn't come from me, all my peace that comes from God, I hold it and I live it and I live the love of God that the one thing that's going to happen after I get to this mature level, is that people are going to see God in me. They're going to see God in me. And, and, and that's when this country is going to get hungry. And they're going to say, how did that person maintain themselves? How are they not knocked down? How are they not running? How are they not cowering down? How are they not striking back? And it's because of prayers like this. Hallelujah. And when we become complete, we become usable. We become a vessel that, that's reckoned to be messed with. Because no matter how big the storm is, we can get right in the middle of it. And the peace is already there. Hallelujah. God, God wants to use us. He wants to use us, and in order to do that, we've got to deny ourselves. We've got to put our life down, and I'll tell you, with everything in me tonight, if you'll put your life down, if you don't care tomorrow where you go, but you ask God where to go, if you don't care about what your job is, who you are, anything, but, but, but what your assignment in Jesus Christ is, what his will, his way, and his purpose is in your life, you'll live a life loved like you've never loved before. And once you do that, people are going to say, that love that's abounding out of that person, I want it so bad. And I believe that's part of this prayer. What a message tonight. This has really been an awesome time. One thing I mentioned, I said, love attracts angels. And a lot of people are interested in the miraculous. They're interested in the supernatural. And God is, is like you said at one point, naturally supernatural. It's a good message. Y'all should look at that one up, read it, listen to it. Um, but... If angels inhabit God's presence in heaven and God is love, 
why wouldn't they be? You think they're going to be attracted to someone who doesn't uh, show love, who doesn't abound in love? It's not going to happen because they're attracted to godly things. They desire to look into the things that we're given, but they don't just hang around when people are living in iniquity, selfishness, and you want to attract angels and the supernatural in your life, you start loving, loving God, and then loving people. Um, you know, the Lord is, there's a couple things I want to say in closing, and I'm, we really are closing. Uh, Sister Vicki, your post that so many of the time end with the phrase, living loved, and I know people have probably uh, seen that in her posts, that kind of inspired me to begin to study about this um, agape prayer, so I, I appreciate that. But, um, you know, we, we are believing for the third great awakening to happen. Yes. And um, as I begin to study the first two great awakenings in history, the first one, the real emphasis was a restoration of faith. It really was. Uh, the second one, the second great awakening, was really rooted at the basis of the approach was a restoration of hope, hope in God. We're wanting a third great awakening. And now abideth these three, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. I need you to catch that. Love is greater than faith. Do you realize that love is the maturity of faith? Hope is love in its smaller form. In other words, the full maturity of faith and hope is love. And the reason why love is the greatest of these, because the world in its darkest hour, in a time where people are confused in identity, and all of this love is going to have to be now, yes, it's got to be balanced out with the severity of God. Absolutely. Behold the kindness and severity of God, the Bible says. But, my goodness, there is really something so profound about love being the thing, the church, the people of God, really matured, abounding in love as that prayer. And I really am asking everybody that's connected to this ministry to pray this prayer every day. I think it's a worthy prayer. And you asked a good question when you said, when, when I started this tonight, what is the purpose of this? He quoted a verse in 1 John 4, 18. There's no fear in love. Let me back up. 1 John 4, 17, sorry. 1 John 4, herein is our love made perfect. Now look at verse 18. Notice it said, herein is our love made perfect. And then verse 18 says at the end, he that fears is not made perfect in love. And it hit me. The reason why Paul gave us this agape prayer was because he was writing to churches. They had a measure of love for God and people, but they hadn't been perfected in it. Hence, verse 17, herein is our love made perfect. And then verse 18, he that fears is not made perfect in love. So when you begin to pray for a bounding love, you're actually praying to be perfected in love. So... And, and, and then Paul gives us in Philippians 1 and 9 in the prayer. Go back and read it again. When you are perfected or abound in love, then your knowledge of God is accurate and increased. Your judgment towards others and situations is trustworthy. Why? Why is your knowledge increased? Why, why does God endow to you the mysteries of the word of God? And, and I could ask that question. How many of you listening wish that God would just show you those deeper things, give you a knowledge of the mysteries of the word of God? You know how it happens? You can be entrusted with that level of revelation, knowledge, when you've been abounding in love. 
Because 1 Corinthians 13 says, Though I understand all mysteries, but have not love, it's nothing. And not only when you abound in love is your, does your knowledge increase, but your judgment is trustworthy. You will live a life of excellence in your job and your friendships, your relationships, and you will walk without offense. You won't be able to be offended. Wow, what a thought. Church people not being able to be offended anymore. And the last thing he said that you would produce the fruit of the Spirit in righteousness. That's the agape prayer. And I ask and challenge all of you to begin to pray. First, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, 10, and 11 every day and watch what happens. Because you can't manufacture it, friends. You can't say, well, I just want to, you know, when you hear some, well, I'm a loving person. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Well, that may be true. But I think sometimes we confuse the definition of love with, you know, how to be nice sometimes. That's not love. Love is, well, you know how to tolerate people. Or, and begin. Love is not even, I can be sympathetic. Those can be fruits of love, but that isn't love. And many times when people say I'm a loving person, they're just saying I can be nice or I can be kind and, you know, people can, I hope people recognize that in me. That's not necessarily love. I don't think many people even know what real love is. I don't even think most people know how to love people. They don't know how to be in a loving relationship. They don't know how because you can't love without God because love isn't just an attribute of God. God is love. Not your perspective of God. You say, well, the God I've heard about and read about, he sure doesn't seem loving. I didn't talk about your perspective of him because your perspective can be limited in your bias or experience in the past. Talking about the true and living God is love by nature. And as you abound in him and you grow and abound in love, then you can be entrusted with more spiritual knowledge, spiritual authority, judgment, excellence, fruitfulness, and living a life without offense. The agape prayer. We hope you'll join us tomorrow in person at 11 a.m. God bless you for tuning in tonight. We will upload this to our YouTube channel. God bless you and good night.